good morning or good afternoon. Uh, I'm Philip Middleton, uh, Chairman of OMPIF's Digital Monetary Institute, and I am delighted to be joined uh, this morning in London by Ashley Alder, who has very kindly agreed to, to, to record a session with us. Uh, Ashley is an enormously senior and influential regulator. He is chair of IOSCO, the, the board of the International Organization of Securities Commissions, which is a, um, a, a global uh, think tank and policy board for uh, the, the securities and exchanges markets. Um, and in his spare time, uh, allegedly, is chief executive officer of the Securities and Futures Commission, so the, the principal regulator uh, in Hong Kong. Um, we've got together this morning to have a conversation really about crypto assets and crypto in its broadest sense, um, how securities markets regulators are approaching it, um, whether these are payments or investment assets or gambling, uh, how or whether they, 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 they should be regulated. And for, for our conversation, we are uh, not really looking at CBDC this morning because that's covered uh, uh, elsewhere in the seminar. So um, se securities, payments, crypto, whatever. Given the fact that the crypto market allegedly is now, depending on the, on the time of day and the day in question, somewhere approaching 2.1 trillion US dollars, um, which, whilst that sounds a large number, is actually still relatively uh, small compared to the the, the volume uh, going through um, exchanges and, and, uh, and markets more generally, but, but still significant. There is a growing concern that it may be a source of financial instability. It may be a source of or facilitating uh, criminal behavior. It may be a danger to retail consumers. And indeed, it may be a, a, a danger to some institutional users. Um, so some big questions about should this be regulated or banned? And if it should be regulated, how are you going to do it? And what are you trying to mitigate? Uh, and what failure will you allow um, if we accept that it's not the job of regulators to pre prevent commercial failure uh, at, at any cost? Uh, and what approaches should be taken and what's the balance then between uh, national and international approaches. So we're going to look first initially at the, the broader international dimension where there are suggestions that the regulators are still stumbling somewhere behind the markets. Uh, and indeed in some parts of the world are stumbling more than others. Um, and then we're going to move from there and look at the Hong Kong dimension. So uh, everyone's paying to, to hear you, Ashley, so that's enough for me. So, so <laughs> over to you. <laughs> okay, well, look, thanks very much for that uh, uh, kind introduction and context setting. Um, yeah, I, I think it's broadly true that the regulators are stumbling behind the market. Um, if you look back um, where we now we're in, you know, we're in May 2022. If you looked back to May last year, um, the general view of regulators at an, at an international level, that's sort of conversations in the Financial Stability Board and within IOSCO, uh, whose board I chair, uh, and BCBS, et cetera. Um, the view at the time was um crypto uh is relatively niche and doesn't necessarily pose a financial stability re risk um partly because of the sheer size or lack of size of the crypto uh world in comparison to uh global financial assets and global financial services activity mm -hmm. now that has completely changed in that very very short period of time and and what was what was a sort of white wait and see um approach has now uh uh changed into one where in a recent international meeting uh i heard from multiple um 
participants that now it's all about the three C's, COVID, uh, climate, and crypto. So, and crypto then obviously has, has, uh, has you know, rocketed up the agenda. Uh, so we're now into a, a period where uh, I think regulators at a na national level um, at different speeds and taking different approaches in reality. Uh, but, but especially at a global level, this is a very, very large part of the global conversation about uh, for, you know, financial sector regulation. So the question really is in a little bit more detail, why is that the case? Um, well, first, um, as I've mentioned, we've seen an enormous growth uh, in, in uh, crypto assets, crypto trading, everything crypto. But also we've seen a, a very uh, significant growth in or, or development of complexity around that and the way in which crypto interacts with uh, many other financial and non-financial entities, individuals and activities. So the complexity aspect, I think, is important. The second is um, increasing involvement with mainstream finance, or possibly the other way around, mainstream finance becoming increasingly involved with, with crypto, partly as a result of uh, client demand, whether those clients are retail right through to family offices, uh, you know, from an investment perspective. Thirdly, um, and I think you alluded to this, you know, why crypto? Why, you know, is there a difference between, you know, is it something that you can leave alone, pure caveat emptor, or don't regulate it? Well, you know, uh, I'm sitting in Hong Kong at the moment, uh, just across the border, crypto, ascent to all intents and purposes, is banned, and it is a choice. You know, that's that's a that's that's a, it's a regulatory uh, uh, it's it's a it's a political and regulatory choice as to whether to ban it or not, and that to an extent is associated with the focus on uh, central bank digital currencies in China, in mainland China. You can ignore it, uh, or you can regulate it. There's only three things you can do. Ig ig ignoring it, if you don't ban it, is simply not viable because it would simply be an ad abdication of um, uh, an abdication effectively of a public policy responsibility or public sector responsibility to look at something where there is uh, obviously a lot of promise, particularly around the underlying technology and its applications, but also potentially um, uh, risks and harms, and including consumer, including consumer harm. Now, when it comes to crypto and uh, its, you know, what it claims to be, one of the reasons why. I think financial regulators do need to be involved once you've decided that it's a um, it's you know it's a public sector responsibility to do so. Is that, is that crypto does claim to be part of the financial system, in essence. You know there are there are multiple claims from multiple aspects of the crypto world that it is money like in some way, and I think from the, the from the position that was held again some time ago, not long ago, but some time ago, that. Um, because pure crypto assets, you know, such as Bitcoin, have no uh, uh, intrinsic value, and there's always a comparison around intrinsic value and other uh, more familiar financial assets. That therefore, you know, it's not, you know, there was a debate about is it a commodity, is it a currency? No, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And does it have the attributes of of uh, money? I think there's a view at the moment that. One of the attributes, or one of the three main attributes of money, uh, it is starting to resemble, which is a store of value. The jury's still out on whether it's a, um, you know, it's a it's it's a viable means of payment um, and a unit of account. You know, the other two aspects, but store of value, let's have a look at it. So that's another reason. Um, we've seen also more recently an increasing correlation. Um, when it comes to pricing of crypto assets with other risk assets. Um, and finally, I think there's a growing realization, which is a bit of a larger point, that there are aspects of crypto that could inform quite profoundly the future of finance, um, and whether that's central bank digital currencies or private, private crypto, as it were, non-central bank and how they interact. So that's, that's why we're doing it. 
I, th I think when it comes to um, the risks, um, so you know, once you've decided that that, that that there's a there's a rationale to look at this from a regulatory perspective, and if you look at the risks that we then need to address, they're multiple, and you know, the um, there is a wall of worry about this in reality, uh, in the conversations at a, an international, you know, institutional level, um, and I can go through a film operational resilience and, and susceptibility to cyber risk. Operational resilience has seen to be broadly pretty low in comparison to you know, conventional financial services um, and financial systems. Uh, secondly, if problems arise, the, there are uh, few or no systems of redress. Thirdly, um, uh, volatility is sort of endemic to the um to the crypto world now volatility is obviously a feature of conventional uh, financial markets but the relevance of uh extreme volatility goes to confidence effects and confidence effects matter so far as financial stability is concerned as the um size of the crypto world grows um there is uh i think uh, a, a ver very high level, or, or sorry, a, a high level of opaqueness and an associated, you know, lack of transparency in the crypto world, not only from the perspective of regulators, but obviously from the perspective of participants. There's, of course, which has been trailed for some time, the sort of organized crime and anti money laundering angle to this. There are questions around legal certainty. There are really important questions, and this is a particular focus when it comes to international institutions around uh, the cross-border aspects. You know, traditional financial services, notwithstanding the fact that many of them tend to be global, still ten tend to be anchored in jurisdictions. You know, whether listed markets or whether it's financial institutions, such like that, is not the case uh, for crypto. It's extremely fluid when it comes to the sort of nationality of assets and the nationality of platforms basically let me, let me, let me unpack it with that because there's a tremendous amount there actually um i suppose my first question is what is it what is crypto you've alluded to the fact that it may be an asset it may be a form of gambling it may even be a payment system um uh, and, and there's an irony here in that many of the promoters of crypto would argue that they are explicitly trying to avoid the conventional financial system, be that of payment or investment. They're, they're, they're trying to get away from uh, regulators. They're trying to get away from traditional financial services for a whole variety of reasons, which range from um, you know, libertarian philosophy to wanting yeah. to be Want, wanting to make a very very fast buck but you know there is a difference massive difference between a payment instrument such as potentially bitcoin um all the way through to uh, a laughing monkey uh nft non-fungible token um and then in the nft sphere there are some some very um interesting plausible commercial business cases emerging, such as, for example, music copyright, um, because of the, the immutability and transparency aspects potentially afforded by, by blockchain. So I think this raises the question about what, what is it we're regulating and is this a security, is it a payment instrument, is it something else? Secondly, who are we regulating? Because there is a vast array now of players ranging from conventional financial institutions, existing uh, FIs, who one presumes are regulated anyway, and it shouldn't um, cause too much, cause us too much effort to say, well, this is just another financial instrument, so we can slot it into uh, whatever regime we have for financial instruments once we've decided exactly what they are. Um, to a whole host of players who sit way outside the perimeter of current financial services regulation, whether the, uh, the so-called VASPs, and uh, if I can do some mm -hmm. advertising for the FSC, you produced a very, very interesting paper uh, recently on 
on, on, on VASPs and in particular intermediaries uh, with, with respect to, to cryptos and some of the issues uh, uh, around that. And I, I commend it to our audience. It's, a, it's on your web, website and a, a very interesting read. So if we're saying actually there are systemic and institutional risks inherent in some of this stuff, what's our perimeter look like? What are we going to regulate and who are we going to regulate? Well, I think firstly, yeah, okay. So I, I personally don't think that spending too much time on a sort of top-down philosophical overview is particularly helpful. Um, okay. I, think that, I think that conversation could go, maybe interesting to academics, I think, I think the conversation could be never ending. Um, the and firstly secondly perimeter issues are not confined to crypto we come across them all the time as regulators so you know in another context um uh, uh esg ratings and those firms that 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 uh, assign esg scores by and large are not regulated but they're very very important of course there's a conversation going on about whether they should be regulated because that again you know, in the, the sustainable finance world is to a, to a large extent uh, relatively new. It's not necessarily something that one would associate with traditional financial markets, but it is being looked at as a matter of financial regulation amongst other things. So if you look at this from a, this from more from a bottom up perspective, the basic approach is, you know, applying, um, you know, the very familiar mantra of same business, same risk, same rules. That, that's really what, what, what's happening. Then you look at, um, a, a, a in the context of, you know, financial activity. And as I said earlier, you know, there are effectively, either explicitly or implicitly, there is a claim uh, on behalf of um, those who promote or are involved in crypto that it is money-like and it has attributes and performs functions which are similar to or analogous to conventional financial, you know, financial sector act activity. So that's the, uh, I think that's the approach. I think we've also now got to the stage where this may not be comprehensive, but we're looking at this in a few buckets. The first bucket from, you know, when you take the, you know, same business, same risk, same rules approach, the first bucket is financial stability. And the second bucket broadly is investor protection, which then and they overlap. Mm -hmm. And the third bucket is um, is more to do with uh, uh, AML issues, FATF expectations um, on uh, AML procedures and checks and all that kind of stuff. So that that's really where it's at. I think I think the um, if you look at um, do, I mean just to elaborate on that that a little bit, if you look at you know traditional financial regulation. By and large, it's organized around, you know, distinct uh, entities or institutions or activities. But in, when it comes to the entities, they're pre pretty familiar. They're banks, you know, brokers, asset managers, custodians, issuers, you know, et cetera. The, the issue with crypto, which, are, which is why I don't think it's particularly difficult to analyze it from the perspective of a financial markets regulator, is if you look at, um, say, crypto platforms, by and large, once you break down what they do, they 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 both bundle um, uh, a set of activities and services, which are versions of what you would find in conventional financial services, but they're bundled together, um, and they also dis disintermediate as part of that. So, you know, those who interact with crypto platforms will do so directly not through a third party intermediary because the intermediary function is bundled into the into the whole so you'll have you have that but once you as i say once you analyze that you'll see that many of the activities are very similar and ultimately there is a effectively an investment case now an analogy to that which is again why you can to an extent evade too much of a philosophical view if you look at the way in which collective investment schemes are regulated in many jurisdictions, it's it's the it's the it's the scheme itself and the collective nature of that and the fiduciary nature of that, etc., 
Um, and But the underlying property, the underlying investment could be anything. It's not limited to securities. It could be art. It could be, you know, it could be real estate. It could be, you know, whatever, you know, not conventional financial assets. So that's why I think some of these arguments about what it is, what isn't and such like is a bit misplaced. I think is actually we deal with these other problems in other contexts and other aspects of, of, you know, our work as financial regulators. I think the big, the big thing with, with this, well, the two big things, one, once you've decided that there are sufficient analogies, which you can get your, your arms around, there are two issues. The first of which is, um, lack of a regulatory nexus, particularly when it comes to decentralized finance, um, the technology stack that operates there, and uh, the claim, at least, that uh, the smart contract, uh, was, well, smart contracts have replaced a, 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 you know, a centralized authority uh, who could have responsibility or, or could have identified responsibility to a regulator. Or have legal responsibility. That's the first thing. The second thing, of course, is I mentioned, which is the the uh, sort of shape shifting cross border nature of this, where the you know, the activity is not anchored to a particular jurisdiction or even one, more more than one jurisdiction. So th there's a there are two dimensions of um, challenge around the connection between what a regulator might want to do and the ability of the regulator to actually have a sufficient um, nexus with the activity to apply the regulation it feels it's appropriate. And that's not, a, not an issue that's been uh, sorted out, which we need to work on. And from your perspective as chair of, of IOSCO, where do you think international standard setters are on some of these questions? Uh, Fairly early days, I think quite, I think sort of, I, I'd use the word exploratory more than anything else at an international level. Of course, you know, a lot more is being done at jurisdictional level, but it's fairly disparate. So I think, but, you know, in the UK, as far as I understand, right now, it's more about registration from an AML perspective. You know, that might change, you know, going forwards. In the U.S., the you know there's a, the 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 president has uh, asked you know quite a you know the regulatory community to think hard about it, mm. <laughs> to what to do next. Um, uh, you know, so so there are different different approaches in different places. Um, so I think it's quite uh, it's quite early. It's interesting if you compare this crypto and the international conversation and international cooperation around it to uh, say climate finance. Climate finance is way ahead. There are so many international efforts at various, you know, the International Sustainability Standards Board, the International Platform, the G20 group, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. There isn't anything like that for crypto at the moment, which is why actually it's early, early days. But I do think now it's, as I said, it's seen as one of the three C's. So it's very, very important. It's gone up the agenda. So I would not expect that to be the case same time next year. Um, I think that will, is bound to change. In fact, all of the, uh, we've already set up the working program. So within the Financial Stability Board, um, uh, one of the principal committees that's chaired by Andrew Bailey uh, is now working on so-called unbacked crypto. That's basically anything that's not a stable coin. Um, uh, and I, together with uh, John Cunliffe at the Bank of England, even last year, we produced a, uh, a report on the payments dimension of stable coins, you know, which, which fundamentally concluded that if you, if you apply the international rules of, um, relevant to uh, financial market infrastructure, the PFMI, as they're called it, that's the acronym, mm. Um, then uh, what you will find, among other things, is that um, uh, stablecoin, there are big question marks about their, the fact that they, the settlement may not be in central bank, bank money or commercial bank money, which is, a, which, is a, which is a requirement. And secondly, coming back to the, the familiar point, you know, uh, is there a legal entity with legal responsibility and regulatory responsibility 
um, uh, to a domestic regulator. And uh, of course, when is a stable coin not a stable coin? Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Well, I think people uh, have yeah people have pointed out that maybe the word stable is promising a little bit too much. Um, and then how do you do that? Can we um, drop down a level to to Hong Kong, where clearly you've got immediate jurisdiction and power to uh, to to, to uh, apply practical steps here? Well, what are you doing there? Actually, I think what we I think what we're doing here is in a way where quite a few jurisdictions will get, and interestingly, I think we're doing it a little bit earlier. So there are there are two, there are two um, elements. The first of which, and the SEC I think has also pointed this out. You know, where's the place that um, uh, most members of the public, most people who interact with crypto, uh, actually do that, and that is in relation to crypto platforms, which people like to call crypto exchanges. So mm -hmm. what we have done already is that we've, 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 we've created um, a regulatory framework uh, for platforms to be licensed with us. Um, and that framework, and it goes back to what I mentioned earlier on, it basically combines and adapts to the crypto world a whole set of expectations that you would normally see in conventional uh, areas such as exchanges and brokers and such like. So, you know, it goes through things like, you know, safeguarding client assets, you know, rules around access to the platform, transparency, market manipulation rules, you know, conflicts of interest, risk management, operational risk. You know, it's quite a long list. They're all quite mm. familiar, but they are bundled and adapted. So they're adapted to, you know, custody, um uh techniques like wallets hot and cold wallets how they operate how they interact and such like so that's what we've done with that the problem we had actually was that our remit a little bit like the sec only goes to securities and most crypto assets are not it's not securities bitcoin is not a security so we are now um in the process of uh putting through legislation to to extend that uh licensing regime to uh, all platforms trading any crypto asset. And will that, uh, apply, will that apply to the metaverse as well? Uh, it will apply to a virtual asset service provider uh, platform, which can, which can register. So the metaverse, I think, is more of a concept than a thing that you... Well, that, that in, you, in the online game Middleton World, we, uh, we use a currency called Alders, um, which are traded <laughs> within... Traded within that world, um, you know, we, we, are you regulating that? Uh, it would depend if 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 there is a uh, a a platform whereby an asset which may be used in the metaverse or may not be used in the in the metaverse, if that if 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 the asset may be traded across that platform, then the answer would be probably yes. But look, as you know, when it comes to regulation, it'll be definitional. In the well, answer, and, and, see what and, the remit is. and if the server maintaining that platform sits on a remote Pacific island and my customer is in his bedroom in Hong Kong uh, online, it's going to be very difficult for um, for you to, re to regulate her, isn't it? Yeah, well, actually, which is why the, the what that's why the international standards aspect is so important. Yep. Because you're absolutely right, you know, that the you can do as much as you're able to in a jurisdiction, in an individual jurisdiction, but unless you have uh, a, a global agreement, then, you know, then there's a problem. Then you get to the point where there may be one or two holdout jurisdictions, as, as it were, who want to uh, indulge in regulatory arbitrage, but then you have to deal with that specifically. Final question, because we're running to the end of our time. Where do you see all this heading? Where are we going to end up? I think in the medium term, probably where we'll be is regulation of platforms. You know, from a regulation perspective, you know, I, I think there's no doubt that the uh, that the same business, same risks, same rules approach will apply. Um, the I think the other area which we will be focusing on, which we are in Hong Kong, actually, I should have mentioned, is that where what's the other sort of um intersection point 
which regulators can focus on? Well, it's the uh, d- degree to which traditional financial services, banks, asset managers, etc., cetera, um, are interacting with crypto and their clients. Uh, so we indeed have- the, the, Indeed, the on and off ramps between fiat and crypto. Absolutely, abs- and that actually is absolutely critical, that on off ramp piece to get a greater understanding of what's happening in the crypto world and the, and the attendant risks is super important. You know, so when it comes to intermediate, conventional intermediaries, then, you know, again, it's an adaptation of concepts like suitability, you know, disclosure, valuation, risk management, conflicts of interest, et cetera. So, um, yeah, that's the thing where we, I think those two areas, platforms and the intersection between conventional uh, financial services and crypto and their clients, that's where it's going to be headed. Um, and then I think also the AML aspect is really quite important. You'd have seen that, you know, the travel rule under the FATF expectations yeah. and, and, and all of that. Beyond that, that's medium term, I think. Um, uh, I don't really know, but I think the, <laughs> because the, the industry develops so, or the activity develops so quickly. But um, I, I think that ideas that this would operate um, autonomously or independently of conventional notions of regulation, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. I fully concur. That's a, uh, and I think we're going to be looking at a new form of regulation and a new approach to regulation. And I look forward to us having that conversation uh, in the future. So it's a standing open invitation to, to you to come back and talk to us about how that is all going. Um, at this juncture, I'd like to thank you very much indeed. Ashley Alder, Chair of the, uh, of the Board of IOSCO, uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Securities and Futures Commission in Hong Kong. You've been very generous with your time and with your thoughts. Fascinating uh, conversation. Thank you very, very much for, for your contribution to the symposium. And we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.